Habeas Corpus, bitch. Let's get this show on the road. Whoa. <laughs> uh oh. Oh no! <laughs> You're quite ahead. <laughs> it works. This is Legally Drunk, the show where I get legally drunk and rant about the law. Today we're talking about the iconic free speech case Hurley v. Irish American Glib and also Leprechauns. But first, we drink. Because what's St. Patrick's Day without beer? Today's drink is brought to you by Guinness. But not really Guinness, please sponsor me. It's an extra stout, bold and bittersweet. Ooh, it's kind of heady right now because I don't know how to pour a beer, apparently. Mmm, foam. At least it didn't spill. It's true, you didn't spill a drop of it. That's, that's something. That's the ideal. You know, um. I can't, I have, I can't take a swig of it. Do you want to like spoon it out? No, just, just just give it a second. It just needs a second. Two thousand years later. It's it's an extra stout. For those of you who love Guinness and love stouts, you're gonna love this beer. Ah. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> That's a good Guinness. All right, <laughs> get out of here. Hurley v. Irish American Gay, Lesbian, and Bisexual Group of Boston is about an Irish American LGBT group who wanted to be part of the annual Irish parade in Boston. Unfortunately for them, the private veterans council who hosted the parade did not want the rainbow in their pot of gold, so to speak. You hear what I'm saying? So they did everything they could to deny Glib entry to the parade. Basically, a lot of politics went down because the governor and eventually mayor were on board with Glib and tried to broker a compromise between the two groups, but they were rejected by the Veterans Council. Naturally, Glib sued. They sued the council, they sued the city, they sued your dog, they sued everybody. The court compelled the council to let Glib march in the parade under a Massachusetts law which forbade discrimination or restriction on account of, well, a bunch of things, but included sexual orientation relative to the admission of any person or to treatment in any place of public accommodation, resort, or amusement. So Glib marched in the parade. And it did not go well. Extreme hostility. Smoke bombs. Everywhere. I mean, we're talking about 1992, friends. It was not exactly a welcoming time. The next year rolls around, and the council is extra sneaky. They declined money that they normally received from the city in support of the parade to make them a fully private entity, and then... Again, they denied Glib's application. The court, again, did not like this. They deemed the parade a municipal celebration and a public festival and not a private event. The court stated that it did not violate the council's First Amendment rights because the statute simply forbade groups to be discriminated against based on sexual orientation, not that the statute demanded Glib be allowed in the parade, and that any infringement on the council's right to expressive association was incidental. And none of that really made sense to you. <sighs> so Glib marched in the parade again, and there was less hostility. Still, there were smoke bombs, lots of smoke bombs, and spitting, and snowballs too, because it's March and it was snowing, so that's fun. But hey, it was 
tree, friends. It was not exactly a welcoming time. So the Veterans Council appealed the permanent injunction and lost in Superior Court. Judge Flannery, a very Irish name, might I add, Boston. Judge Flannery wrote, history does not record that St. Patrick limited his ministry to heterosexuals or that General Washington's soldiers were all straight. Inclusiveness should be the hallmark of the parade. By the way, I don't think I mentioned this, but not only did the parade celebrate St. Patrick's Day, but it was also a celebration of the British soldiers leaving Boston because of George Washington. So it was kind of an all-inclusive parade, if you catch my drift. And it makes it especially Irish because if there's one thing that the Irish and the Americans have in common, it's that we both don't like those Brits up in our business. Cheers to the Irish. So the council canceled the parade in 1994 because, I don't know, they must have given up or something. But for the 1995 parade, they came back even sneakier. The council stated that the parade would have a political theme this year and therefore Glib could not participate because they represented speech the council disagreed with on a political level. This time, the US District Court ruled that the parade was an exercise of the council's free speech and that they could restrict participation to those who endorsed their political stance. In response, the mayor said no city employee would march in the parade and the mayor wasn't part of the parade for the next 25 years until the parade finally allowed LGBTQ groups back into it fairly recently, I think a few years ago. And then they tried to kick them out again and then there was a huge uproar. Basically, be inclusive in your event, even if you don't have to be. I think that's the moral of the story. Mm. That's a good Guinness. So finally, after all this went down, if you're keeping track, there were a lot of different court cases about these issues. Uh, but finally, the Supreme Court granted cert in 1995 and decided in favor of the Veterans Council. The court reasoned that the Veterans Council could not statutorily be prohibited from excluding the messages of groups it did not agree with nor could it be forced to endorse a message against its will. Justice Souter wrote, One important manifestation of the principle of free speech is that one who chooses to speak may also decide what not to say. So, some weird outcomes here. Technically, a private organizer could then put on a St. Patrick's Day parade where they excluded all Irish organizations from the parade. A private organizer could put on any kind of public event and exclude the very organizations which represent that event or holiday, which again is a little strange, but it's the Supreme Court, so they make it up. To me, this is a classic case weighing the importance of anti-discrimination statutes with First Amendment rights. So legal scholar and gay rights supporter Arthur S. Leonard stated that lobbying and education were actually better than litigation as a strategy for promoting gay inclusion and said that this case was actually carefully crafted to the issues raised by the parade, while at the same time upholding the authority of the state to ban sexual orientation discrimination. So to me, I think that every court interpreted their facts correctly for each time and that this was consistent with prior case law. It's strange and definitely has a strange outcome, but is interesting. So what do you think? Is this decision right or wrong? Leave a comment down in the comment section below and tell me what you think about Hurley. Let's move on to leprechauns. Leprechauns exist, apparently. <laughs> oh, wow. So under European Union directive, leprechauns are protected and the area they're believed to inhabit, the Cooley Mountains in Ireland, are also protected. Because, you know, leprechauns are endangered and exist, apparently. Let's read through an article together and see what all the fuss is about because I'm really curious 
to hear about these leprechauns. So the leprechaun site and local economy have benefited greatly over the years from the connection with Ireland's mythical little creature. The directive was part of an effort to preserve the rich biodiversity of the area called the Schlieffoy Loop. Now a protected area for flora, fauna, wild animals, and you guessed it, leprechauns. It is a long detailed procedure and has taken nearly eight years to secure the future of our heritage, culture, and folklore. We are delighted in the knowledge that our little people, our little people will be protected from extinction and allowed to thrive in the mountains. Local man Kevin Wood said of the directive in 2011. The group of locals who lobbied for this protection directive and also organized the annual leprechaun hunt in the area said the directive was put through in spite of objections from the Black-Faced Mountain Sheep Breeders Association. Their site says the EU has opted in favor of the rich biodiversity of the Cooley Mountains, and this area is now protected under the European Habitats Directive. So I just want to back up here and, um, this article doesn't talk about the uh, leprechaun hunt, but if you were just reading through this article, it's a little confusing because this group just um, petitioned the European Union for a directive to protect an area, to protect the leprechauns, and then they also put on a leprechaun hunt. So if you really believe that they're hunting leprechauns, couldn't they not hunt them because of this directive? However, this, this article does not go into the details of the leprechaun hunt, but the reality is that the leprechaun hunt is just a fun tourist activity. They have these like gold coins that you have to go out and find and they give you whiskey, which, yeah. So it's not a real leprechaun hunt, but I just want to point out that it doesn't make any sense within the context of this article. So. But I almost missed my lips there. Moving on. Woods, a local man and one of the original members of the group, explains that there are only 236 leprechauns still living in Ireland on the Foy Mountain at Slate Rock. He believes that this is the spirit world. 236 leprechauns. How does he get such a specific number? How does he know? Has he gone out and counted them? Has he asked them, like gone up and talked to some leprechauns and asked them like, did he ask like how many leprechauns are out here? Maybe there's a little signpost that says Leprechaunville, population 236. And that's how they know. Like this is such a specific number. I, I assume under European directive law, like they would have to have some kind of number for an endangered creature or something. But, ugh, 236 leprechauns, okay. So, moving on. The story goes on that uh, in 1989, PJ O'Hare, a local businessman and publican, was upon Carlingford Mountain when he heard a scream coming from the area beside the wishing well. <laughs> you felt that you needed to drink after that. <laughs> it took a lot out of me. Being curious, he went to investigate and found a patch of burnt ground. Besides the patch, beside this patch, he found a little hat, jacket, and trousers with four gold coins in the pockets. The whereabouts of these four coins are only known to one other person. Seems legit. But he maintains that he can't give away the secret. It seems even more legit. The clothes of the naked leprechaun are on display at PJ's Pub in Carlingford. The discovery of the suit led to the establishment of the Carlingford National Leprechaun Hunt when hundreds of people descend on Carlingford in search of the naked leprechaun. So just going back here, it says that there is a population of 236 leprechauns. Um, but one of them's naked. And you gotta find the naked one, and you win more whiskey? I don't know. But, I mean, what if you found a clothed one? Would that be more disappointing? 
Also, do you think that the naked one never would have made new clothes or do found you new clothes? Do you think he wouldn't have made new clothes? Or found it? Oh, he did lose his four gold coins, so maybe he lost all the money to his name and he couldn't get any more clothing. But I'm just imagining a leprechaun streaking through the mountains of Ireland and I'm, I'm not disappointed. I'm actually not very disappointed in that at all. So, in addition to being <laughs> named a protected area for leprechauns, the Sleeve Foy Loop to Ireland is also a beautiful tourist spot filled with natural wonders. Francis Taylor, Cooley Peninsula tourism officer said, this is another significant recognition from Europe in regards to our heritage and tourism product and the way in which it is responsibly managed. You know those commercials where they say drink responsibly? Well, this is Ireland's version of that. Drink whiskey and search for nude leprechauns. Drink responsibly. Protect leprechauns responsibly. He says, while we are delighted with the increase in visitors that are discovering this area as one of Ireland's most beautiful hidden gems, we are committed to sustainable and responsible tourism, including whiskey drinking. Uh, we believe it is vitally important to be sensitive to the environment and all inhabitants within the destination. So that's interesting. Um, even more so, it brings up some interesting questions about jurisdiction and conflict of laws. If you were to say, enter into a contract with a leprechaun or had a custody disagreement over a changeling, after all, under fairy folk law, they look at the plain letter of the law and disregard the spirit of contracts. So you could easily see a situation where a fairy would violate a contract by frustrating the purpose of the contract under human law. I really don't get me started on the changeling thing. Maybe we should designate protected areas for our own Sasquatch in North America. I'm pretty sure they prefer the term Sasquatch or Yeti rather than Bigfoot. It just, it seems infantilizing. Like when in the article they refer to leprechauns as their little people. It's just disrespectful. And I'm really thinking hard about the polar ice caps and how Santa Claus and elves are affected by global climate change. It really makes you think. What is what are we gonna do about all these mythical creatures? I mean, do they need their own protected areas? Like, what are we gonna do about them? Well, I'll drink to the leprechauns. Once upon a time, there was Santa Claus, but then the North Pole melted due to global what warming. What are we gonna tell our children when the, when the caps melt? They're gonna be like, how can we be like, well, Santa lives up in the North Pole and the, and the kids are gonna be like, there is no North Pole. What are you talking about? What are you f***ing talking about? Don't, don't say f <laughs> <laughs> Especially when talking about children, Skylar. <laughs> what are they gonna do? In the spirit of St. Patrick's Day, what is your favorite mythical creature? Where are they located? And do you think your parliament or Congress should designate them an endangered species? Let us know in the comments below. Please like and subscribe and hit that little notification bell so you never miss another episode of Legally Drunk at Fox Hollow. Remember everybody, I'm an attorney, but I'm not your attorney. And I'm not driving tonight because I'm legally drunk. This is actually really good. I'm not, I'm not disappointed in this beer. <laughs> that's a good Guinness. Ooh, that's a good Guinness. <laughs> From St. James Gate, Dublin. That's a good Guinness. That's a good Guinness. <laughs> Let me try again. That's a good Guinness. <laughs> Scaly, the first time I thought I had a Lavinia heart attack, I thought you were going to throw up your drink. <laughs> it's washing around. <laughs> I'm going to piss
eso, eso. So typical, so competitive. I'll take up your offer and give you some of your own medicine. Your heart's darker than a pint of innocence. Stepping up, and I ain't leaving till you finish.